What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. It's your man's Nicholas. I'm here with Dr. Jesse Morse today of the Fantasy Doctors, continuing our video series talking about some of the players that were injured last year. A month or so back, we looked at running backs that we want to either target or avoid in 2019 fantasy football based on the injuries that they've either kind of incurred throughout their career or that were serious in the 2018 season. And we're going to do the same thing looking at the wide receiver position. Now, this was easily one of the most valuable one I put out on my channel for the 2019 season so far. We talked about Todd Gurley. We talked about Davin Cook. We talked about a lot of those guys. And I mean, you were right on the head with Gurley because at that point in the offseason, this was, you know, a month and a half ago, I had still been looking at Gurley as a top three guy. And then you had been like, no, the, you know, the arthritis is going to be a big deal. We're going to have to see what happens throughout the offseason, you know, what the Rams do. Do they start um, showing us signs that they're worried as well. They re-signed Malcolm Brown since then. Now they just drafted Daryl Henderson in the third round. So clearly there's something there and you kind of hit that right on the head. When they traded up, I was like, oh boy, mm -hmm. they're showing their hand and there's really, they don't have a choice. So they have to. Kind of staying behind their initial statement about how they're not worried about the knee. But at this point, you know, all signs point towards exactly what you had kind of said. So that's something to look forward to. If you missed the running back video, of course, I will link it up here as well as in the description. I would highly recommend you go check that out. But again, we're going to talk about fantasy football wide receivers in 2019. There was a lot of guys that went down with injuries. There's a lot of guys that I, I would kind of consider injury prone. So we're going to dive into all of them, including, you know, Odell, Sammy Watkins, Martin Jones, some veterans, uh, some younger players. We're just going to dive into probably the most popular move of the offseason. That was Odell Beckham getting traded from the Giants to the Cleveland Browns. Now, when I look at Odell Beckham, right, everyone's going to immediately throw him back into the top three fantasy wide receivers, if not, you know, the number one guy, because they see the ceiling with him joining Baker Mayfield over there in Cleveland in this new exciting offense. He has played in one full 16 game season since entering the NFL. He missed four games last year with a, a little bit of a quad injury. He shattered his ankle in 2017. So, you know, he's missed a full 16 games over the last two NFL seasons, a site that I use, and I'm not really sure what your thoughts are on this site, or if you are, you know, are familiar with it or how the workings of the site work. It's uh, sportsinjurypredictor.com. It's an interesting yeah, site that, that kind of gives you a pretty good job. It's hard to have enough staff. We, we learned this at the Fantasy Doctors. If you're not getting paid, like, regularly to, to 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 continue content it's really hard to to continue to to supply data and still have like a full-time job like most of us at the fantasy doctors are physicians uh half of us are surgeons uh the other half are either physical therapists or something along those lines so like we all work 40 50 60 80 90 hours a week so th there's not many minions, I like to call them, to kind of like crunch the data, have it available and constantly update. Like that's hard to do. Right. That takes time, money, resources. So there are other websites that are good. And while we'd like to think we are the number one in terms of everything, that's just not realistic because it's too hard to do that. We're good at what we do, providing mm -hmm. updated injury analysis, but there are other good sites and that is, that's one of them. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I like how they're kind of like very defined with everything. When you go to a player's page, they have exactly their injury history as well as their projected games missed for this upcoming season and whatnot. And the only reason I bring it up, it's not like I, I you know, I, I'm black and white when it comes to a website like that, when then they're telling me how many games a guy is going to miss, but Odell Beckham is listed as the guy with the highest projected games to be missed in the 2019 fantasy football season, which, you know, was uh, a blaring, you know, red flag for me because he's someone, the ceiling is not in question. If he's on the field, even if it was with Eli, if you told me that he was playing 16 games in 2019 with Eli, I'm like, okay, he's easily a top three, top five fantasy wide receiver. That was never, you know, my question His talent is not the thing, but the injuries, something that's plagued him throughout his career. Tell me uh, how big of a concern Odell is for you, um, where you're thinking about him in, in fantasy. Is he too risky to throw him back in that top three, top five conversation? So now that we're like fresh off the 2019 NFL draft, everybody, football is back in everybody's mind. Yes, sir. You know, uh, let's kind of delve into uh, easily the biggest name injury wise or just polarizing figure wise this off season, maybe besides Tyreek and only that's recently. Right. So obviously Odell has had some injuries, like you mentioned, but he really injuries the past six months weren't really a big deal. It was more controversy, this, that, 
I mean, Peppers plus a first and a third. And right now you, you can't grade the trade because it, you, we don't know who these two guys are and, 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 and how they're going to amount to. We'll have to look a couple of years down the road and see if this is going to be a good trade or whatnot. But what I think of is that o- Odell suffered a freak injury two years ago. His quad last year wasn't a big deal to me. Mm-hmm. If he was, if they were competing, he probably maybe would have missed a game maybe two. It was hamstrings and quads are unique, but different quads injuries. If you, if you treat them and you get them quickly and, 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 and early, you can nip them in the bud hamstrings. You don't have that choice. You have to wait. Right. And even then they don't feel right. Even if you do everything perfectly, that's just hamstrings and that's why they suck. So, I mean, Odell is going with his old college buddy. Now he's got a, a cannon in, in, in Baker. He's got Chubb. They've got Hunt. They got Najoku. They don't. They, it's not just him and Saquon. Like there's a lot of options. So it's going to be hard for the defense to just be like, oh, double team uh, um, OBJ, and then you know, and then stack the line. Right. You can't do that anymore. You have Jarvis over there. Like this is going to be a dynamic offense, assuming everybody stays healthy. You know, he managed to top 100 yards or a TD in eight of his 12 games. Maybe he plays two of the last four, and he does um, ten of a uh, ten of uh, fourteen. That's pretty good odds. Like yeah. that's definitely top five worthy. I think he could have easily played at least fifteen or maybe fourteen games. Uh, obviously, uh, that quad could have really lingered, but I don't. I don't really think it would have. I think they would have addressed it, and then they would have babied him a little bit, and that would have been the end of it. I don't think it affects him long term whatsoever. This is not like a hamstring where you have to worry about it coming back every every year, like Leonard Fournette. Like that's I'm not worried about that. Uh, I mean, okay. I think he's going to be a top five uh, wide receiver. He's only 26. I feel like he's been around forever. Yeah, because um, he gets so much hope. Yeah, I mean, and and now he's like a sneaky playoff contender where, where the Browns are. You at least you, you expect him to be wide receivers versus. Uh, versus uh, running backs in the first round, eternal debate. But, I mean, there's less bell cows, so you're probably going to want to uh, go running back early. But if this is 7, 8 to 10, 12, 16, depending on how big your league is, I don't, I can't blame you. Okay, so, you, I mean, obviously the talent is there with Odell, right? If he's on the field, he's going to be an elite fantasy producer. Um, mm-hmm. But you're not worried about any, like, injury concerns because the year prior, you know, you had told you – were, you were saying, like, stay away from Odell because I don't trust, you know, what happened with the ankle and whatnot. So the fact that he's, you know, far off removed from his actual – the big injury that happened a couple of years ago and last year he had nothing significant. But he had dealt with hamstring injuries, you know, in college and, like, when he first came into the league. So you think those are just like few and far between. There's nothing in his history that suggests that he should, you know, that he's probably going to deal with something like that again. No, I mean, uh, you guys, the, the guys always uh, have a tendency to get hamstring injuries early in, in the season. That's just like something like 70% of them, probably higher than that, or within probably the first four weeks of preseason and the first three or four weeks of regular season. Like that's just what happens. These guys don't, they, they go from doing nothing, quote unquote, nothing for six, seven months to ramping it up and their body's not ready. They go from maybe 60, 70 percent to, quote unquote, 100 percent. And the body's like, uh-uh, sorry. And then they try to come back on it because they need to get out there and or, or, they, or they're trying to get their job. And and then they and they tweak it and they make it worse. And now they're out for even longer, a la Leonard Fournette. Right. Uh, but no, I'm not I'm not worried about him. He proved last year that he can stay healthy. The quad was a freak injury, even later in the year. If it was in the middle of the year, yeah, that could have really lingered. But it was at the end of the year. And if they were in contention, I don't, I don't think it would have been a big deal. Okay. So draft Odell um, as you would without injury concerns. Now, there's another elite wide receiver who, unlike Odell, is he's past his prime. Maybe not past his prime, but within the next year or so, he will be past his prime. He played in nine games last year, and I'm referring to A.J. Green of the Cincinnati Bengals. He aggravated his groin early on, um, and he didn't miss any time. Then he injured his toe halfway through the season. He missed a bunch of games, tried to return in week 13, re-aggravated the toe. I think that, I feel like that was pretty um, – obvious to see coming even from someone who wasn't like a doctor it was just you could tell that they were rushing him back and he wasn't fully healthy they were very vague with you know his injury timetable they're like oh you know he'll be back soon he'll be back soon he'll be back soon wasn't really practicing um anyways you know in in that 
week 13 game where he re-aggravated it. He got carted off. He underwent season-ending surgery for some torn ligaments in the toe. He had shed his walking boot in February, reportedly, and they're planning on easing him into OTAs. And there are talks, you know, the, the reports I've seen, I'm um, just trying to get a little bit of extra, like, you know, pieces of analysis here from the team is that, you know, they are talking about extensions with him, but I've also heard reports where they were looking to move him in the draft if some good trade talks came his way. So those are very contradicting. So it's kind of hard to get a clear picture on what they, the franchise actually thinks about him. Um, he will be turning 31 at the end of July. So he's older. He's missed four more games in three of the last five seasons. He hasn't hit 1,300 receiving yards since 2013. So Green, you know, the talent is there and he's someone who is always looked at as an elite wide receiver. He puts up great per game numbers, but it always feels like there's just something, um, you know, missing there. And now that he's coming off the serious injury and he's getting a little bit older, his ADP is being pushed back really far, like almost to the end of the third round, early fourth round. And given, you know, the talent, you want to say pull the trigger there, but should we be concerned with this toe injury, um, knowing that he's had a, a decent amount of time to recover, but will it be long enough to have confidence in him, you know, drafting him in maybe like the third round or something? Those are all really valid questions. I feel like the decline has be, has had had begun a couple of years ago and it's continuing to go. So I'll paint the picture. Week 13, playing Bengals playing the Broncos. Green goes down with a non-contact injury to his foot. Never good, yeah. Remember that he had the same issue in week eight that they, as you mentioned, they kind of dilly-dallied and never really said, oh, yeah, he'll be back in a week or two. And then it was like three, four weeks later, and it still wasn't back yet. Right. So they, I think what they realized was they, they, it was a partial tear of some ligaments in the toe. The toe is super important uh, because you needed to push off. You needed to run, jump. That's pretty much the definition of an NFL wide receiver. Like without the, the big toe, it's written that you're balanced uh, in your foot too. Without that, you are going to be really, really restricted. They probably tried to rush him back or they gave him a decent amount of time, but it just doesn't heal that quickly. Timelines don't care when games are. That's just that, that that's what it takes to heal. And these guys all think they're superhuman, so they think they can push it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, these are the guys that make the timeline. So, you know, unless you're Adrian Peterson, you, you, that is what it is. So this is classic turf toe. So he had a partial tear of turf, turf toe based on kind of what we found out. It, it never really came to light. Then he ended up basically fully tearing it. The issue with a full tear of turf toe which is essentially the ligaments in and around the big toe is that without them, your toe is really unstable. So think of your thumb, but on your foot, right. that's basically what it is. So you need to surgically repair these period. This is nine to 12 months Ooh. period. Yeah. This is not a quick injury. This is a big deal, especially for someone who needs to push off uh, kind of cut on a, on a dime jump. Like this is going to be tested over and over and over again. Um, so now we're starting to talk about June roughly is roughly nine months. Here's, here's my thoughts. Here's my advice. Watch the tape when he gets back on the field. Is he confident in this toe and this foot? Can he make hard cuts? Can he push off aggressively? I mean, if he can't do any of this, Mm -mm. will he get a little better? Yeah, but he can easily re-tear this or re-injure it or cause a new injury because he's baby in this whole side. So if if everything's not in flux and and, and properly aligned, you're going to have some new injuries. I don't think he's in the top 15 anymore. I just, on a game per game basis when he's healthy, yeah. But over the whole stretch of the season, I, I I don't think so. Yeah, you got to look at the bigger picture. And I do think some of the injury risk is definitely baked in, but it's not so black and white like, okay, injury risk baked in, good pick. You know, it's like what you're saying is like you actually have to be um, on top of these things and actually look and see, is he confident? In it? And I almost feel like it's it, it's been um, less time than that because if it happened in, you know, the full tear was in week 13, I'm not actually sure when the surgery took place. So whenever the surgery took place nine months from then, I would almost is like July, probably maybe closer to, to that range, August. So it's even a, a little bit riskier. So um, definitely keep it. A- he didn't have any setbacks. So he, like mm-hmm. that's assuming everything went perfect. I mean, if you have Darius Geis type of situation like that, you know, those things, uh, thankfully that came out early enough that we heard about it, but that very well could have 
uh, could have happened with anybody. You can get infections. Unfortunately, that happens. Yeah. Um, so I, I, what we'll probably do is I'm sure, you know, in, in the summer, I'll bring you on again, one or two or however many times we want to do this again, you know, like later July, maybe early August or something, we'll plan to get back on and knowing what we know at that point, you know, seeing some of the training camp footage and, and seeing some of uh, that stuff, we could probably get a much clearer picture, but it's just to kind of get on the radar for the people out there that are, you know, just jumping at the fact that, oh, AJ Green is such a value now, but there are a lot of red flags there. So let's move on to another um, former Cincinnati Bengals wide receiver, Marvin Jones of the Detroit Lions. Now, Jones went under the knife after uh, suffering a, a painful bone bruise in his right knee last year, which is kind of... Uh, I guess, weird to the, to the common person because you think of a bone bruise and you just think of a bruise, right? Something that would heal, not something that you necessarily need um, surgery for, but it cost him the final seven games of the 2018 season. Supposedly, he will be all, system go for, uh, all systems go for Detroit's offseason program. Now, prior to this year, Jones had missed just one game over the last four seasons, so he's not someone that you would consider you know, uh, an injury risk whatsoever. And before getting hurt last year, he was on pace for nearly a thousand yards and eight to nine touchdowns. So in my eyes, you know, he just turned 29. So he's still got a few more years um, of his prime in the NFL. I think he's one of the more underrated fantasy wide receivers, you know, going into 2019. Is there something more to this surgery? Because I, I for me, it feels like it's uncommon to have surgery for a bone bruise. Uh, what's the like healing process, rehab process like? Is, is this something we need to be worried about with Jones? So think of banging your arm on a door frame or whatever. Okay. You're likely going to have a bruise for I don't know, a week or two, something like that. That's fine. That will go away. Not a big deal. Well, the issue with a bone bruise in uh, or a bruise in a bone is that these stupid things take forever. Okay. Analysis studies say anywhere from six months to a year and a half until that bone bruise completely goes away. And most of the time, you can only document it on MRI. You can't see it on x-rays. Uh, you can assume it's there or, or have suspicion it's there, but you can't prove it until you, unless you get an MRI. That time frame is uh, assuming you do, that's just like natural healing, healing right? Not, not having yeah. surgery. Okay. Uh, I, and, and, and here's the thing. Unless there's a fracture, surgery isn't going to do anything. So I don't know why they did surgery. So here, here, there's a lot more to this story that they haven't let on. Okay. Here are the main options. And I, I did, a, I tried to look and it they literally didn't say anything else. So they, this is under wraps. Okay. We know that Schefter, Adam Schefter said that, uh, that Jones had a bone bruise and that his ACL and MCL were intact. That's all. That's basically all we know. And then Patricia, uh, Lions head coach basically declined to give any more information, but that's literally all we know. So, he was having a good season, 35 catches, all over 500 yards, five TDs. Uh, I mean, they weren't the best team. Um, so that's decent for, for, for a mediocre team yeah. uh, that ended up beating my Patriots. Uh, while, the, <laughs> while the details are scarce, my suspicion is he probably suffered a, a, a meniscal tear. That's, if I were to bet my money on it, that's what I would say he had. Okay. If he had an ACL tear, we would have knew about it. Yeah. They would have definitely said it. If he had an MCL tear, I mean, Schefter said he didn't have one, but we'll, we'll take him for his word, which we usually should and do. But even if he did, that probably wouldn't have caused a bone bruise, but maybe it would have. So think of you have uh, the upper and lower leg bone kind of sitting like this. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is these basically smash into one another and one or if not both, caught have some bruising in in and around the joint okay so basically this happens with an acl tear this can happen with um with the tibia plateau fracture uh which is what um aaron Rodgers actually had last year and uh jj watt had a couple years ago but these are very high impact injuries uh the if you look at an mri depending on what shade you're looking at usually the whole bone is black uh, that's just how it's supposed to look well, any inflammation is going to be white. When you see a bone bruise, it, the whole bone is like white or a part of it is what, depending on how much is bruised. So, okay. uh, but they're, they're not going to go in and do anything surgically for a bone bruise unless there's a fracture or something like that. So right. I, I don't, 
why they did surgery, I don't, I can't explain unless he had a meniscal tear, unless he had a small fracture, unless he, uh, he tore his, uh, you know, MCL or his PCL or his LCL uh, or something. Uh, he, something had to have happened that they haven't commented on. So my suspicion is it's not a big deal. Okay. But could he have had a, a grade two or three MCL tear and a meniscal tear and a bone bruise? Yeah, that's very, very common. Very possible. And, and, and you would have had to, depending on how big the piece of meniscus is, you trim it out um, unless the guy, unless he wanted to do rehab uh, without trimming it. Uh, if the, if the MCL is uh, large enough and, and the tear is big enough uh, or severe enough, then you have to surg- surgically fix it a grade three. If it's a grade two. It's like partially torn. That's what Baldwin had. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Um, but my suspicion is this is not an ACL. This is probably a, a, a meniscal tear. I'm not overly concerned. Um, I think this he's going to be a wide receiver three with wide receiver two upside. Right. I think that's realistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and he's been really injury free, like you said, the whole most of his career. So uh, the part of the issue I'm having is that there's kind of a lot of mouths to feed in Detroit. Like I don't know what they're doing. Uh, is Johnson still like the head guy? Uh, like I don't know. I I don't know what they're doing. Right. We don't really know their identity. I f- they want to become a run first team, uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to throwing the ball, it really boils down to having Galladay and Marvin Jones. And now that Galladay is you know taking over as that wide receiver one, Jones can do what he did in Cincinnati when he was playing behind AJ Green and be like the wide receiver two that doesn't have to face the top cornerback. So that's really why I see it, you know if he's completely healthy, you know. And I guess we'd have to assume that by when the season starts, he he is just based on what we know. Um, I think he can, you know, be that downfield threat that he has been for Stafford without having to take on the true number one cornerback. So you say like the bone bruise could take anywhere from six months to a year, a year and a half to heal. And, and you said the meniscal tear. Now, how long does that what's the rehab process like for that? If, if, if it was that. So uh, the bone bruise may uh, technically show up on MRI that long, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's in it, you're, he's in pain for that long. The, the pain can fluctuate. Uh, it just it fluctuates on how large it is. Uh, these guys get the best care you can really get. So yeah. my suspicion is it probably doesn't bother him anymore. Or if it is, it's very mild. It's so if it doesn't bother him, there is there any like re-injury risk? Does that force new injuries upon anything if it is still there? Or is that just completely pain, playing through a pain kind of thing? Uh, that's playing through a pain. That's what Aaron Rodgers did. He played through a, a bone bruise through the whole year. I mean, and okay. we found out a fracture, but that not, uh, that's more of a pain tolerance thing than in anything else. Okay. The meniscal tear, uh, that's a couple of weeks to a month. Uh, they okay. don't repair those, uh, because they just don't heal well. So you, we don't surgically repair, uh, meniscus really ever just because it's not realistic. So he should be a hundred percent as of right now, unless we find out something significant happened. And then of course that changes things. But as of right now, I, I consider, um, him a hundred percent. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's, that's what I had figured. And, uh, like you said, he's wide receiver three with like that weekly, cause he makes a big plays. He's a weekly wide receiver two upside. And I think the fact that people are going to forget about him because he kind of missed the ending portion of last year and they think of the lions and they're like, ah, not a great offense, but I still think he's a good player with good years left ahead of him. So he's someone you could probably draft outside of picks like 90, a hundred or something and, and grab as your wide receiver four or five on your team that can give you good fill in value. Or if he does end up like emerging and coming back as the Marvin Jones that we knew, you know, be a sneaky wide receiver two, three play for you. So let's move over to L.A. and we have Cooper Cup. He gets out to a flaming hot star, right? He's doing things that you would not have imagined him to do for your fantasy team. He like quickly became the best fantasy option on uh, on the Rams as as a wide receiver. And then he sprained his MCL in week six. He misses a few games. He returns and then he tears his ACL in week 10. That's about around mid-November-ish, I believe. So all the reports that we've heard so far have him making good progress. His rehab is where it's supposed to be. Originally, they said that they want him back for training camp, but now they're talking about the goal is to have him back for week one, which is obviously much more realistic given the timetables that we know for, for people who tear their ACLs, especially, you know, towards the end of November, that would give him, I don't know, whatever the math adds up to be nine months, 10 months to fully recover from it. And they're not going to rush him into a meaningless preseason. It's not like he has anything to prove left into this offense. He's an integral piece of it. Now, are, are you concerned? One, are you concerned with the timetable, him getting back to week 
one and being ready for the full season Two, my thing is like, if that's all they're preparing him for, if the goal is to get him back by week one, would you be concerned that um, if they throw him right into NFL action, like he, uh, he's at a higher re-injury risk because he wasn't participating in training camp, his conditioning won't be there, he wasn't on field with the Rams for those four preseason games, um, and, and that puts him at higher risk for, um, for re-injuring himself or you know injuring some other part of his body. How do we feel about Cup? So I like Cup, but I'm avoiding him this year. Okay. And, 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 and uh, the, I'll start with that. He was off to a monster 2018 season. Yeah. I mean, if he continued without this injury, assuming all things equal, he would have been 80 catches, 1,100 yards, and 12 touchdowns. That's probably top 10, if yeah. I, maybe top five, I don't know, without looking at the numbers in specific. But he had a concussion in week five. He had a sprained MCL in his left knee, which cost him two games. Then he tore his left ACL, okay, in November, like you said. Is there a connection? Probably. Maybe not 100%, but probably. Was he wearing a brace? I don't know. A lot of these guys, are, it's, they're wearing stuff over it. These new braces are really sleek, and, and, and you can't even tell. Did it prevent his MCL from tearing, but it put more stress on his ACL? Was his MCL still healing? Yes, I can tell you that right now. Which then caused his ACL to get additional stress, which then caused it to tear. Probably, but it is what it is. Right. We know he suffered an ACL tear. The standard appropriate timeline for an uncomplicated ACL, meaning just the ACL, maybe a little bit of a meniscal tear, is 9 to 12 months. You start adding new ligaments uh, like Carson Wentz and stuff like that, then you're looking at 12 to 15 months. So uh, 9 to 12 is appropriate. The issue that I see with, with these, these guys is that you assume this guy's going to be on a trajectory it going straight up for several years until they peak and then they come down. Well, when you put that ACL in there, I feel like it throws a monkey wrench in their trajectory. Okay. So it's going to either plateau them or it will make them drop. And then they just will never have that same peak that they would have had if they didn't tear it. Add in significant, in my mind, significant increased risk with for a second ACL tear. So if you tell me, you're going to have a 30% chance of re-tearing that ACL or, or getting a second ACL tear in two years after the first injury. Would you consider that significant? Yeah, definitely. That's what the data shows. It's, it's a combined of both knees. So meaning there's roughly 21% on the same tear and 9% on the opposite knee. Now, this data wasn't done in, in, in NFL players because that's obviously very hard to come by. But the, 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 nonetheless, it, they're getting better, but there's still, there's still a lot of risk. Why is opposite knee a big deal? Because that's what happened to Deshaun Watson. Like, this happens. It, just, it doesn't happen often, but it happens. All right. Um, most position players, running backs and, 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 and wide receivers in my head, do not mentally feel – 100% until their second season back. Many people who have had ACL tears, professional athletes, have come forward and said, this is like 70% mental and 30% physical. You have to confide and have faith in that ligament to allow you to stop and turn on a dime going 15, 20 miles an hour. Right. That's, that's the ligament that's doing it. And it's surgically repaired, and it takes a long time for that repair to, to take to mold and, and to be strong. That's the issue with these: is that the, for three, four months, they're not even allowed to cut after the surgery. Like they can go straight line, and that's all. Eventually, they're slowly allowed to cut. So I compare this to kind of Julian Edelman of 2018. That's how I look at this. Okay, was he as good as before? Probably not. Was he still serviceable? Oh yeah. But he, I just don't think he was as good. And maybe we'll see him. I mean, he's older, but maybe we'll see him s step up this year. But I feel that 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 cup is going to disappoint people this year. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that that nine to twelve timetable 
like that nine months would be basically the end of August, early September. So the very, very beginning of when the season starts. So if he's not fully ready, both physically and mentally at the earliest of that rehab process in the nine month mark, then you're looking at a slow start and a higher, you know, re-injury risk chance for a guy like Cup. So I could totally see how um, baking in more, more injury concern there. And I think a lot of people, it's tough to to gauge where he'll be drafted because I think maybe people who owned him last year will understand how good he was prior to the injury. So they'll say like, yeah, he's the first Rams receiver I want off the board. Some people will kind of forget about him because you, you look at Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks and they both put up very, very good fantasy numbers without um, both with and without Cup. But one thing for sure is that that Rams offense runs a lot smoother with Cooper Cup in the lineup. So for them, from a team standpoint, it would make way more sense for them to ease him really slowly back into the lineup, have him ready by like the second month of the season, maybe playing very minimal snaps, you know, over the first month of the season, then getting eased into the lineup as the season progresses, because they're a team that, you know, I don't know if they necessarily need to get off to a a scorching hot start because they'll probably be in the playoffs one way or another. And to have, you know, cup ready for that, I think would be a big, um, a big boost for them. He's definitely at increased risk for soft tissue injuries in the first six to eight weeks as well. So okay. your hamstrings, your calves, your groins, the stupid stuff that lingers, basically. Yep. So, then, I mean, those are the things that end up costing players time anyway. So, yeah, it's um, it's definitely concerning. I don't know. Uh, at his cost, depending on what it is, I, I probably I won't be interested just because his expectations will be too high and his, I, I don't think it's realistic. Yeah, I think him and uh, I would assume I think it's going to go Brandon Cooks and then Robert Woods and Cooper Cup are going to be really close to each other. I said Cooks will probably be a fourth round pick in that range. And then Woods Cup will probably hinge on like the somewhere in, in the fifth round range. Definitely take some caution with Cup there. Let's talk about Sammy Watkins. Now, I, I don't I don't necessarily want to get into him as like a player and his talent and just the whole situation, because. What it's looking like is Tyreek Hill is not going to be playing football for the Chiefs in 2019. So that opens up a, a massive hole for targets and, and production with Patrick Mahomes as the quarterback, of course. But Sammy Watkins, it's just very hard to gauge how to value him, you know, taking into account both the Tyreek Hill situation and the injuries that he's, you know, basically been played with his entire career since coming into the NFL. He played his usual 10 games last year. He had a foot injury again. It seems to be like a constant theme throughout throughout his career um, since entering the league. He missed the last five games of the regular season, though. He did return for the playoffs, and he looked very good. He went six for 62 against the Colts. He went four for 114 against the Pats. He had eight targets in both of the games. So clearly, when he's on the field, he is a part of this offense. And they signed him to a fat contract. So that tells you that it's not like, okay, um, we're really worried about his his injury risk or we're really, you know, we're just kind of hoping that he plays a big role in the offense. It's like they want him to be on this field and they want him to be a big playmaker because he was a very early pick in the NFL draft and he's had these big seasons in the NFL, but he's never really been able to put it all together for one reason, whether it was playing with a bad quarterback or whether it was moving during the middle of the summer or it was the injuries that really have plagued him throughout. So like what, what are the chances that we're going to get 14 plus games from Sammy Watkins this year? What, you know, like how much risk do we need to bake into drafting him? Um, wherever he ends up going, depending on the Terry Kill stuff. So the way I look at, uh, at Watkins without all the other haziness right now is that he is a wide receiver three with wide receiver one upside with significant injury risk. Okay. At best, he's going to get you 10 games. At best. I, in light, I mean, so let's let's walk back and see exactly what he's done. All right. He played 10 games in 18, got caught 40 passes on 55 targets for a 13 uh, uh, yard per catch average, 520 yards, three touchdowns, eh? five rushes for 52 yards. All right. Six games missed with a right foot injury. We don't know the details of it. They really never told us. If they did, I couldn't find it. But here's the issue. He's had two surgeries on his other foot. Right. Both were Jones fractures. And my suspicion is one was Jones fracture, and then he he refractured it, and he had to have either the screw replaced or a longer screw put in. Can you come back from Jones fracture? Oh, yeah. Julio Jones has a, had a Jones fracture. A lot of guys had a Jones fracture. Very common, unfortunately. 
Jones fracture is a is a fracture of the pinky toe of the foot, kind of towards the back, more towards the heel than the tip. Right. Uh, the issue is it doesn't have a good blood supply and it doesn't heal well. So this is what Greg Olson had last year as well. So this is unfortunately very common. The issue is I don't know what he had on the left foot that caused it. Was it just a foot sprain? Was it a Liz Frank, which is the middle of the foot and very important? Was it a toe injury? Like there's a lot of different possibilities. But one thing we can tell is that he hasn't just, he can't stay healthy. It's not one thing, it's another. When he's on the field and healthy, he's dynamic. You saw that. But when he's not on the field, you know, what good is he when he's injured? I'm, foot injuries scare me. Um, they have a tendency to rear their ugly head at unopportune times. I don't think there's ever a good time to get an injury. Um, so I personally wouldn't draft him just because of the risk. I mean, unless you're drafting him as a wide receiver five or six and you know when to play him. Okay. But uh, you're probably, that's probably not going to happen. Okay. Could he end up being the chief's number one? Yeah. I mean, that may be worth the risk if Hill is gone and, Kelsey can't get all the targets and that, you know, that may be part of it, but uh, I don't know. Injury risk. There's a lot of caution. Yeah. I mean, we know, we know this passing offense is going to produce numbers. We know Kelsey's going to get his, whether it's, you know, 1200 yards, 1500 yards, whatever he goes for. What we don't know is, okay. So let's say Terry kill, you know, he's off the chiefs next week. Another report comes out that they, you know, they let him go. Sammy Watkins supposedly steps in as the wide receiver one, I would assume that that his ADP shoots up to like mm-hmm. something ridiculous. You know, it's going to, in some leagues you might see it as high as, as like the third round. Cause people are going to be really ridiculously hyped about it. Um, I would say he'll probably settle into like the fourth round ish there. Now, knowing what we know about his, you know, the injuries that he's dealt with is the fourth round uh, a spot that you're going to be completely off Sammy Watkins, or are you going to like mess around and maybe take him in one league and avoid him in the other leagues or something like that? So this may be a guy where I draft him in the fourth or maybe fifth round, depending on how lucky you get. Yeah. Assuming he is the number one, they start off hot and then I flip him. Okay. But that's a lot. There's a lot of question marks there to do it. You know, the issue. So I'm a big fantasy baseball guy. So the issue with fantasy baseball versus fantasy football is that if you, Lose your first, second, or third round pick in fantasy football, it's like damn near impossible to win the league. Yeah. You do it in baseball, it's such a long season. There's so many rushes, like you can, you can absorb that. The guys come back in a month or two and you're fine, like you're okay. It's hard to do in, in, in football. You can't do it. So, another adding it, another thing is that he's never caught more than 65 passes. Yes. And that, and that was back in 14 with yeah. Buffalo. It's like the injury like, risk plus a uh, plus a lot of projection into it plus a lot of people you know wanting Sammy Watkins to become what they want him to without actually ever seeing him do it in real NFL football. So the case, yeah, the case to be made for him as a third round pick is very, very, very difficult. As a fourth round pick, it's probably also pretty difficult. So it's probably something I would be fading. Um, if he falls to the fifth round, I, I would I would be taking him in you know maybe one or two of my leagues just because I do want to share in case you know, the outcome of his ceiling does come to fruition. He's a guy that could probably win leagues, but otherwise it's, it's unlikely to see that happen. All right, let's move on to uh, another young downfield threat for the Houston Texans. Kid named Will Fuller. Uh, he had a hamstring injury early on in 2018. Then he ended up carrying his ACL in October. He also missed two games his rookie year, six games in 2017, um, and then nine games last year. So he's had lots of hamstring issues, knee, broken collarbone, cracked ribs, more hamstring issues. Um, now everyone loves Will Fuller when he's on the field. Him and Deshaun Watson are a fantastic combo, him across the field from DeAndre Hopkins. And it's great when you have him in your lineup, which is not very often, and it's kind of hard to predict when to put him in your lineup. But when it comes to Will Fuller, uh, he's just not a type of guy that I find myself drafting a lot in season-long leagues. Uh, do you feel the same way when it comes to Fuller? I mean, I think he also gets unfairly scripted as a guy who's just a downfield speed threat because whenever he's on the field, he produces, and he does really, really well with Deshaun Watson. Um, the bigger concern is, you know, I feel like he's an injury risk. Maybe I'm wrong here, but is he someone you look to draft in season-long because he gets that stigma or he gets that, you know, that name for himself as an injury risk and thus he drops in drafts? Or is he someone that you only look to draft in like a best ball league or something like that? Yeah, I don't, 
I, I think he's too risky to, to, to draft personally. Like mm-hmm. we know he has tons of talent. There's really no question about that. The problem is he seems to get injured too often. Like here's his list of games each of the past three years since entering the league. 14 in 2016, 10 in 2017, 7 in 2018. He's kind of going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So, I mean, in 16, he had hamstring injuries and a knee sprain. In 17, he started off the wrong way. I mean, he kind of had this uh, broken or uh, he broke his collarbone, his clavicle, which in missed the first three yeah. games in preseason. Then he missed three more with um, – with broken ribs and then he had minor knee surgery after the end of the season. So like, that's a lot of stuff in one year. Then he suffered a hamstring injury last year in, in, in August costing him the season opener. Then he tore his right ACL in late October. So he's basically had like, he's tweaked his hamstring. He's broke his collarbone. He's broke his ribs. He's tweaked his left knee. He tore his right knee. I mean, he's never not injured you're running out of body parts. Like yeah. uh, there's a lot of things. So yes, I know he's dynamic, but I will let somebody else worry about his headache. Yeah. I- I'm with you there. Unless he drops real far, I won't be taking Will Fuller or unless it's in like a best ball draft. Plus I like his teammate Kiki QC more than I like him, especially where they're getting picked. Um, another guy I do not like, you could not put enough space between myself and Doug Baldwin. And when I originally sent this over, we had not heard the reports that he might, he might end up just retiring because the injuries might be too costly to him. So this whole section might be irrelevant, but prior to us even hearing that he told us last year that he was coming into the season hurt. And that should tell you that, you know, like right away that he was a, a no draft type of player ended up re-injuring himself, groin, hip injuries. Um, This offseason, he's undergone knee, shoulder surgery, and now in April, a sports hernia surgery, which will sideline him another couple of months. Um, There's no timetable for return. He'll most likely miss OTAs, all this stuff. There's just so much moving in uh, away from Doug Baldwin as a draft target. And for the people that thought he was going to be a good value in 2019, I thought it was a ridiculous statement prior to the news that he's probably going to retire. Um, but like with all the stuff that he's undergone this off season already, like if he doesn't retire, is he even worth touching in fantasy? So you're probably going to be surprised at my, your, my answer for this. So he yeah. burned me bad in, 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 in 18. Like I was really high on him. I, um, I actually had, uh, him in probably most of my leagues, my especially my money leagues. And okay. See, that didn't pan out very well. So the good Dougie fresh, as I like to call him, it's been a reliable option for several years, but that changed in 18. Yeah. He suffered that left knee injury in July. Then he injured his right knee in, uh, in I don't know, September or something. Mm-hmm. That was a grade two MCL. So the MCL is the, the ligament that runs north to south on the inner aspect of your knee. Very common injury in football because guys get hit on the outside and that's the knee. That's part of the knee that buckles. Right. Okay. Um, That usually takes uh, three to five, six weeks to fully heal. He missed only two games, so he came back injured. But the problem is he never looked the same. Like Seattle went super run heavy. Um, Like, and and it was crazy because like, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Wilson, like threw the ball like 15 times a game, like nothing. I know. Which is nothing for football, nowadays football. Um, So like the rest of the season, Baldwin really only had two games where he was targeted more than 10 times. Uh, that's not a wide receiver that I can gamble on. Yeah, it's like it's it's not only all these injury concerns, but one, like you said, he wasn't the same player that he was last year. They have Tyler Lockett, who's arguably the better receiver at this point. They also just drafted DK Metcalf, who's going to be the downfield guy for them. They are a run-heavy offense. So Russell Wilson's not throwing the ball enough to the point where you can justify drafting Doug Baldwin from any sort of like efficiency or volume standpoint, like you said, he had a couple of good games. He had the one game against the chiefs where he went like it was uh, seven for one twenty six and a touchdown, but that was a shootout. They scored like 70 points. And if you look at the games that are sandwiched around that one game that Doug Baldwin had, you're looking at yardage totals of 32, 27, 22, 77, 39, 52, 39, 26, like all, all very, very, very minimal. So he wasn't the same player. And now he's going through all these, these surgeries and, and all this injury stuff. I feel like if, if your analysis has to start with, oh, if he stays healthy this year, that's a guy you just have to throw on a lot of risk on top of it. Plus the fact that he's older and it's not like these guys who are 31, 32 recover quicker for these injuries They recover slower and they don't 
get more talented as they get older. You know, they, they, they start to lose their talent because their athletic skills, you know, how fast they are, how quick they can cut, start to diminish with each injury. And uh, for Baldwin, I couldn't get far enough away. Half a second, a half a foot, it all adds up. So when you're, takes, you're yeah. someone who's eight, ten, you know, eight, seven, eight years younger than you, repeatedly over and over again, that adds up. That half a step becomes a pick instead of a catch. Exactly. You know? uh, yeah, so I, I think the situation will settle itself out and he'll just kind of uh, retire. If he comes back and he's like a 10th round pick, sure. Give me a flyer on him. He has the talent. He has. Uh, he'll ha- he may have the potential, uh, but I think there's a lot less reliable people at a higher cost. So if if he's that cheap, I may throw, but we'll see. We'll have to, we'll revisit this in July and August. Moving on to Emmanuel Sanders, Denver Broncos. So he tore his Achilles last year, uh, and that's certainly not a good look for a 32 year old. Sanders is just like Baldwin in the fact that he's a veteran that I am absolutely staying away from. And I was actually looking at some ADPs on uh, Draft.com. Baldwin is pick 92 right now. Sanders is pick 93 right now. So they're back to back. I'm, that's going to change dramatically as we go further into the offseason. And he was a guy I absolutely loved going into last season because it was like a perfect storm. Um, I had been on the train that I thought Demaris Thomas was kind of deteriorating and I did not like him in the 2018 offense for Denver. Um, And they bring in Case Keenum, who literally, no matter who is there, no matter who's playing the slot, no matter where he is playing, targets the slot on a ridiculously high percentage of his throws. So it was like Sanders, still athletic, still looked good down the field, was playing in the slot. And Case Keenum loved throwing to the slot. Now, there are a lot of moving parts when we look at Denver, you know, in 2019, but almost all of them result in me staying far away from Sanders. He'll be nine months removed from the torn Achilles in week one of the 2019 season. Um, That's a notoriously hard injury to return from for someone in his prime, let alone someone who is, you know, 32 years old. You got Joe Flacco as quarterback, no longer Case Keenum, who loves going to the slot. Just not a good situation. So do you need to add anything to that argument with Sanders? Do you remember when Sanders was with Pittsburgh? When what? <laughs> when Sanders was with Pittsburgh? Yeah. It feels like a decade ago. So he's been, this is his fifth season. So he's been he, – he started off hot. I mean, he actually had a pretty good season, 71 catches, 90. He was great over the first half of the year. He was amazing. Yeah, he almost 900 yards, like only four touchdowns, but it's a slot wide receiver, so that's the issue. Yeah. He tore his Achilles in practice. That's uh, – it is what it is, regardless of when it happened. That's just unfortunate. But – this is a surgery guaranteed for athletes. You can't not have Achilles tendon surgery if you're if you're a professional athlete. I put it that way. Right. Um, the data on returning, uh, was, a lot of it was done by my partner in crime, Celine, uh, a year a couple of years ago, um, and, and it's just not pretty. It's bad. Like these take nine to twelve months to return, which is basically September, October, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And what do they basically say? It says the average return to play is nine months. There was an average decrease in power of 22%. In particular, running backs saw the biggest decrease, so not a super applicable here, uh, but Dante Foreman, this applies to, right. of, sev- of 78% decrease over three years. Add in his age, no interest. Right. I can't, I can't, I have no, I don't even know what they're doing. They're going to run the ball. <laughs> exactly. I, I like the running backs. I just, I don't, I don't know. I mean, he's too risky again. Like unless he's a ball when he's a flyer at the end, he's Achilles is hard. I was surprised I even needed to add him onto this list. Cause I didn't realize that there were people who were like getting on the bandwagon of, you know, Sanders coming back next year, which is kind of ridiculous. So for anyone that's thinking about drafting him anywhere near like the single digit rounds or even like top 12 rounds. I think it's just, I think it's just a waste of a pick at this point. Um, Making 10 million this year. Yeah, I know it's, 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 they can't even like cut him, which is the bad part, but no, that's why I was like, shit, I'd make 10 million if I could Uh, and and be injured in rehab, but Hey, he paid his dues. He good for him, but that's yeah. Avoid situation flipping the script. Someone who is, you know, not 32 years old, Anthony Miller is going into his sophomore season with the Chicago bears. Miller was a guy I absolutely loved last year. He was someone I was, I was all in on like dynasty leagues, very uh, disappointing season by most standards. He did end up scoring seven touchdowns, which, um, which is impressive for a rookie receiver. Um, there's not many rookie receivers that put up seven touchdowns in their first, uh, the first season in the league. From what I understand, he was kind of playing with, uh, 
pretty fucked up shoulder since like week two or three um, when he in, when he injured it. Since the season ended, he underwent surgery on the shoulder uh, this off season. So I don't know much about you know shoulder surgery, and obviously that's going to affect the wide receiver because you need full range of motion in your arms and stuff. Assuming you know he had the surgery after the season was done, what kind of like timetable are we looking at with Anthony Miller? Um, because I do believe that he's going to finally you know jump over Taylor Gabriel and get the the snaps and and uh, the play time that I think he deserves to have, and he could be an interesting flyer later in um, later in in draft. So. I don't know much about the shoulder thing. So what, uh, what do I need to know here? So I feel like this kid's like 70 years old, but he's 24. Yeah. He came uh, into the league. He came into the league as a, as an old, uh, as an old rookie. I feel like he's been around for a while, but no, he was just drafted last year in the second round by the bears. Yeah. So we'll walk back a little bit and review his history. Cause that plays a role here in 14. He had to be redshirted due to a shoulder injury. Hmm. I didn't know that. Okay. I don't know what shoulder it was. I don't know what the shoulder injury was, but apparently it was big enough to cause him to basically miss a whole year or essentially. Then he fractured his right foot in his last college game, causing to miss the pro the senior bowl and the combine probably why he, I think he went in the second round. That was all before the bears even drafted him. Then in week three, he suffered a dislocated left shoulder. Shoulder dislocations are unfortunately very common or pretty common anterior meaning popping towards the front posterior popping towards the back anterior is 95 percent it's it's really hard to get a posterior it's like electrocution and seizures like those are the only two ways you get a posterior so like 95 percent is like he had an anterior dislocation if it popped back in which it can happen he may have been lucky if they had to pop it back in either way but this is a ball and socket joint like the hip what happens is when you pop out, you're going to catch a lot of the, you can have some bone fracture here. You can have the labrum is here. The, the cartilage is here. You can take a, and, and take a big chunk off of that. Give age is the number one factor for risk of re dislocating the shoulder. It's like directly correlated. And it's something like, like, uh, like uh, 90% chance. If you're in your twenties that you're going to dislocate it again, it's like that high. It's really high. So my suspicion is he had a, 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 a uh, it's kind of like a splint where it basically prevents it from popping back out. And then he probably had surgery in the off season. Uh, he did have surgery, but he probably had surgery to put pins in to prevent it from popping out. The question we don't know, and I wouldn't be able to know unless I evaluated him and saw the MRI with contrast, is how much rotator cuff damage did he have and how much labral tear did he have? That is directly correlated with, with the dislocation. And, and there, I, there's really no way to, to, to know that without them telling us. Okay. So uh, am I concerned? Not particularly. He said he's feeling better and going to set the world on fire and not in so many words. So that's good news, but he could be just optimistic and not realistic. Yeah. Who else? Who doesn't say that? You know, um, I do like the fact that he was able to, score seven touchdowns, which is, as you said, really surprising in a, in a rookie. If it was a small labral repair and he didn't really have any rotator cuff injury, he didn't have any, what we call the hill sacks or, um, or bank cart lesions, which are, 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 are complications. This is not going to be a big deal. And he, the sky's the limit, but if he had a, a big labral tear, if he had, uh, if he's got some floating stuff in there that he had to have removed, if this is a, if he's at high risk for re-dislocating, this is going to haunt him. He takes a big hit. He, t- he hits the ground hard and it pops out or he gets sandwiched between two people or there's so many different ways it could pop out. Then it could pop out and he could miss a couple games again. He could have further shoulder damage. Like, so it's hard to tell how much damage he has. But the fact that he was able to play almost the whole year is is good. So that means that it was probably minimal damage and he really got really lucky. So he's probably going to be a sneaky buy low in 19. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's what I like to hear. Um, yeah. I wasn't really sure. I know that like, we, I think we've seen a few wide receivers kind of deal with the shoulder injury and it's just like, you know, if it happens early on, it's just something that, that feels like it just lingers the entire season. And, and, you know, that's like the excuse for the whole year. So he's healthy. He's someone that I, uh, I, I think he's really, really, really good bet to, kind of sneak in there as a late round draft pick and he's something you don't have to spend a lot of capital on whatsoever because most people have kind of forgotten about him 
Before we leave real quickly, I'm, I'm going to sneak this into this. I don't think I sent you over his name, but in honor of the NFL draft wrapping up, we have this kid, you know, Marquise Hollywood Brown coming out of Oklahoma, first wide receiver taken off the board. Now he had a, a Liz Frank foot injury so right before the combine that it's almost like irrelevant because he ends up going to Baltimore. So, you know, no wide receiver really going to have a big fantasy impact, but there's a lot of people who play dynasty. And as the first wide receiver off the board, that obviously has to be acknowledged. And he's got to be someone who probably goes in the first round of rookie drafts with the Liz Frank injury. I know there was like a lot of concern with this injury um, for like basketball players. And I know that there was like some people that just never really came back from the injury in full force is, is this injury something it's, it's not something we've heard anything really about with Hollywood in terms of it being like a long-term concern. Is Liz Frank something that would concern you for a football player or a wide receiver like him? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Liz Frank is basically, so think of your foot. I, I just happen to have this in my hand. Think <laughs> of your foot like this. Liz Frank is basically the ligaments that support the arch of your foot. It's the foundation of your foot. Without the Liz Frank complex, you can't run, you can't walk, you can't do anything. Your foot is useless. Depending on how significant this tear is or was, this was probably, I don't know if it was surgically treated i didn't look at the, i haven't looked them up but my suspicion is they did due diligence before they drafted him that high and they're comfortable yeah. with where he is but this could rear its ugly head again and given his offense uh, i probably not worth the risk and most rookies don't end up panning out in the first year anyway i almost feel like this is a pick for the like from a football standpoint for the future not necessarily 2019 um I, and i believe he did have surgery how long does a typical does is it like acl where it's like oh typical recoveries you know nine to 12 months or is it very varying uh from case to case no these take a while uh these these yeah these take a, a many months uh anywhere from six to 12 months i'd have to look at the uh, the specifics but uh, for football, for football, professional football players. But um, yeah, these injuries concern me. A turf toe, Liz Frank and Jones fractures are the three big ones in the foot that scare me the most. I'll do, I'll do something bigger as it gets closer, uh, but uh, definitely concerning. I know he's talented. He's not a big, big kid. So, I mean, I, I, I hope I wish him the best of luck, but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't probably draft him unless I get him super late. Yeah, I think he's like a combo of like a Tyree kill Deshaun Jackson. But considering that it just happened like very, very recently, I almost I'm, it's almost certainly he's going to end up on the pup list to start the year. And who knows, he might end up missing the entire year, depending on how they want to play it. But uh, but that'll wrap up this video to, uh, to, you know, talking about any of the wide receivers that were dealing with injuries last year or, you know, throughout their career and whatnot. And that might make fantasy impacts in 2019. So. Uh, with all that being said, make sure you are following Dr. Jesse Morse on Twitter. His Twitter handle will be linked, been under in the entire video, and it will be linked down in the description as well as the Fancy Doctors uh, Twitter. And uh, is there any, there we go, repping the brand. Is there anywhere else that uh, you want them to look you up, find you, follow you? Uh, no, we, we do some uh, stuff on YouTube ourselves every once in a while for quick specific videos. We try mm -hmm. to do them like the same day. We uh, do have uh, several specific jointed surgeons. What I mean by that is uh, like a couple of our surgeons are, are foot specialists. So okay. they, they are literally the ones who fix, fix the Liz Franks and the, the Jones fracture. Like they are the ones and when they're in the OR, that's what they're doing. We have a couple, uh, Celine is one of them. Uh, we have a couple hand surgeons uh, that uh, will be able to give you very specific timelines that work with professional teams. So we're not giving you generalized timelines. I'm an, I'm non-surgical, so I deal with a lot of fractures and a lot of stuff. But when I need something that's very specific for someone who is fellowship trained in that body part orthopedically, we have that availability. So that where you're getting very specific timelines from people who do this every day. Come along for the ride. We Injuries play a big role. We know that. And we're here to help. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, for coming on and joining me today. And we'll definitely have you back on um, throughout the off season. And, you know, as we gain more momentum, you know, when baseball kind of starts to wind down a little bit for you and you turn your head towards football. So I hope you all enjoyed that. If you did, make sure you leave a comment, hit that thumbs up button down below, subscribe to both my and their channel over there. And, uh, and we'll see y'all next time. So later. Take care guys. Thanks for tuning in.